John chapter 19, let's begin in verse 17, or 16. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which in, is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on each side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, I have What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from from the top in one place. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Let's pray together. Father, we yield to you. We know that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you, and we're seeking you today. We're wanting to engage you. We're not interested merely in religious activity at all. We want to engage the true and the living God, and we're so thankful that we can do that because of what Jesus did on our behalf, and that we who know you have put our faith in you, and what, what Jesus did for us, Lord, to pay the full and satisfying payment for the forgiveness of our sins. We're so grateful that we get to enjoy your revelation. We recognize that revelation is a privilege, and so help us to be good stewards of what you reveal to us today. We don't want just to learn information. We want to be changed, and we want to be doers of your word. So we yield to you now. We pray that you would be our teacher by your Holy Spirit, Father, and that you would help us, Lord, to learn everything and to be changed from the inside out. Lord, and we know that you do work in us so that we can bless others with it. So we help, I pray that you give us opportunity to share what you've spoken to us today. And we yield to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we have finished Jesus' six trials. I called them the sham trials. Um, and we saw, we went through each one of them and we saw how they were, they were, predetermined uh, in the sense of what they wanted to have adjudicated and he was guilty before even being present having the evidence presented and the lord jesus was falsely accused of blasphemy moses commanded in the law of moses that if anyone blasphemed it was a capital crime leviticus chapter 24 verse 16 we're told and whoever blasphemes the name of the lord shall surely be put to death All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as him who was born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. So they were accusing Jesus of blasphemy, the religious leaders. But he wasn't blaspheming because he is the Messiah. He is God in human flesh. He is Israel's king. He is the son of God. There was no blasphemy. They were accusing him falsely. He was just a threat to the religious leader's power. And Matthew tells us that they were motivated by envy. They were envious of the Lord Jesus. That was their motivation. That's the only motivation that we're really told in Scripture specifically of why they did what they did, because they were envious there. So today we'll begin to look at Jesus on the cross. We'll begin to look at Jesus' statements on the cross, what he said while he was on the cross. There are seven recorded statements of Jesus while he was on the cross, and I want to read them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Number two, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Number three, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. Number four, my God, my God, why why have you forsaken me? Number five, I thirst. Number six, it is finished. And number seven, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So today we're going to look at the first one. We're, Lord willing, being go through a different one for the next seven weeks. But he begins with, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So the title of my message this morning is Jesus' first statement from 
the cross. Now we begin in verse 16. John tells us there that he delivered him, then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. So Pilate delivered Jesus to them to be, for him to be crucified. Now I want you to see here at the end of verse 16, notice we're told that they led him away. Did you see that at the end of verse 16? They led him away. It doesn't say that they forced him. It doesn't say they compelled him. It doesn't say that he was fighting, he was resisting. They led him because Jesus had already surrendered to what was going to happen. We've seen that as we've gone through the book of John. He was surrendered, and, and he solidified that surrender in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, not my will be done, but yours be done. In Isaiah 53, verse 7, we're told he was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. You would expect, and most people did, when they were being taken away for execution, they would be begging, they would be pleading. Yeah, this is a decision I need to make here. Um, I need to tell you about my first experience uh, being arrested real quick. Yes, I was. I've been arrested as a child, as a youth. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) So... This was at a store named Payless. I don't know if you remember Payless, but I stole some sunglasses. And my, oh, yeah, that was one of those guys still sunglasses. Well, I was stealing it for a friend, if that helps, but he didn't have any pockets. And so he told me, you know, can you take those for me? You know, and I'm like, sure, what are friends for? And, and so I put it in my pocket and I went and walked out of, pay less with him. And the guy tapped me on my shoulder and said, are you going to pay for those? And my friend just kept walking Uh, because that was agreed upon. Like if one of us gets caught, we're not going to be stupid and have both of us get caught unnecessarily so that we actually had that pre arranged in terms of general trouble. Um, But on the way back to the store, because they were called the police and everything like that, uh, I was begging I was pleading. I was begging my case. Like, my mom's going to kill me. I'm going to please let me go. I will never do this again. I was doing that all the way there. And so obviously this is, this is way more serious. And people would plead and beg, please. They were fighting. They were resisting. And, and, but Jesus didn't do that. Again, he's in control. We've seen that as we've gone through the whole, all the verses. Jesus is in control. And no one takes his life, but he offered it up. He was not resisting. He was willingly going to the cross. Now, verse 17, we're told, and he bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. Now, for whatever reason, John is not led by the Holy Spirit to write down, uh, write about Simon of Cyrene. You may remember in the synoptic gospels, he was a man from Cyrene there. He's, that's like Libya, uh, the area of Libya, and he was there for the feast, and he was there re- getting ready to celebrate the feast, and he was compelled to carry the cross beam of the cross, most likely the cross, we won't know 100%, but most of the time, uh, that's what they, what's the, what they would need to carry. Uh, and so he was compelled, because when a Roman soldier put his, his sword on your shoulder, sometimes it was a spear, They were saying, I'm choosing you and you need to carry something for me for a mile. That's when Jesus said later to the disciples, he said, if they they compel you to go one mile, go two. Because you can't take advantage of a servant. So you can't take from you that what you're willingly offering. And, And so he was saying, offer more, go beyond, serve people, love your enemies. He's already telling the disciples that. But Simon didn't know anything about this. Simon was just there for the feast and he's compelled to carry the cross He could easily have said, why do I have to pay for this man's sins? When in reality, Jesus was going to pay for his sins. Now, we're told that he had two sons. He had some's name, one of them was named Rufus. I forget what the other one's name. Uh, Rufus somehow is stuck in my mind. Uh, But one of them was martyred. They're both, so uh, Simon became a believer, a well-known believer. His sons became believers, and one of them was martyred. And it actually says, in, in 1941, they found an ossuary, a box that held bones that said 
Ru, Ru, whatever son it is, their, their name, the son of Simon. They're in Jerusalem. And he was a well-known, Paul talks about in one of his letters, he, he wants to, to, them to greet um, one, his sons and even his mother. And he said, his mother's become a mother to me. So it was just a man in a situation. He's there for totally different reasons. That he, God has him there for a very specific reason. He carries Jesus' cross. It would have made him ceremonially unclean because all the blood that was from the scourging would have been on that cross beam. And so it would have touched him. He would have become, it would have ruined everything for him. And he probably thought this is ruining everything. We don't know how long he stayed at the, at, at the cross, if he was there the whole time. He became a believer as a result. So for whatever reason, John does not include this. And he, and he says here, he, meaning Jesus, bearing his cross. He did bear his cross for a, for a time, for a, a while. But there was a point in time, likely because of being dehydrated, likely becoming uh, weary because of the scourging, he couldn't carry it for the full length, the full distance. And so those soldiers tapped Simon on the shoulder and said, now you need to do that. So now we're told that the name of the place was called the place of the skull, or in Hebrew, Golgotha. And Luke alone refers to it as Calvary. Calvary comes from the Latin word calvaria, meaning skull. So you didn't know that you went to Skull Chapel, did you? You, went, you're, you go to Skull Chapel. I mean, that's biblical, right? By the way, Pastor Chuck didn't name the Calvary Costa Mesa, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, uh, or Calvary Chapel. He, he was asked to be the pastor when there were 25 people there, and they were getting ready to close the doors. And so he was already named that. He didn't feel like there was ever a point or ever a reason to change the name. Uh, and it just exploded, and we all know the history, most of us do. But um, so that's the name there, the place of the skull. There is a place in Israel when you go there that looks kind of like a skull on the side of the mountain there, but that is only in the last few hundred years. It's not the, the reason why they called it that. It was a place because they, because they wanted to, you know, they crucified people, and there were deaths that happened there, and so that's why they called it that. Now, verse 18, it says that where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Some translations translate the end of verse 18, Jesus um, in the midst. And it was interesting as I was studying, started seeing all the different places that it were, Jesus is referred to as being in the midst. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, done a study on that. Um, and I just want to go through a few of them because it's not by accident that he's in between these two criminals that are there. Uh, we're told in the, in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2, that when Jesus is 12 years old, uh, his parents lost him on, on the way back from one of the feasts there. And, and so they lost track of him. They thought he was with a relative or whatever, but he had never left. Uh, he had stayed behind there. And we're told in Luke 2, verses 45 and 46, so when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was after three days, it's a long time to be without your son, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. In the book of Revelation, the apostle John uh, would later right in chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 then i turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned i saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the seven lampstands one like the son of man clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band and he goes on to explain and how amazing that revelation of, of jesus and his appearance and john fell down as if he was dead this is the same apostle that laid his head upon Jesus' chest at the Last Supper and how familiar he was with them. This is a completely different appearance. And someone that was so familiar with him was still frightened like that. It's amazing when you study that, how he looked and, and everything. It's, it's crazy to think how that was his, his re revelation of what he looked like to John. Later on in chapter 5, verse 6, we're told, and I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Even in the Old Testament, which is interesting, 
Jesus at times appeared as the angel of the Lord. It's called a Christophany or appearing of Christ in the Old Testament. So we see it, not an angel of the Lord, but it's when it says the angel of the Lord. So we, in, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, we're told, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So he, he was in the midst of the burning bush and spoke to Moses. It's amazing. There's so many times where you can see when you study the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, you can get a concordance, you can study it out. It's pretty amazing his, his ministry before he even was born in Bethlehem. The second person of the Trinity revealed himself to man in the Old Testament. But the one that we think about, the one that we're thankful for is when two or more believers are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. That's in Matthew 18. And the context of that, it's always nice to know the context. The context of that is talking about church discipline. So when you are exercising church discipline or when you're, you're dealing with conflict in the body of Christ and you have... Um, basically determine whatever you've determined by going through that, pro that process the way that God prescribes, then he's in the midst backing up your decision. And, and so obviously that's a general truth. It's not just applying, I'm not only, like he's, only, he's not only just in our midst when you're dealing with that context, but it's, it's all the time when two or more are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. And he wants us to know how close he is to us. And he doesn't have this, you know, I've heard of this ministry, this healthy ministry separation, and I, I just don't believe in any of that. I don't believe that any leader should insulate themselves from the people that they're called to serve. There is no such thing as healthy distance. You have to be available. You have to be close to people. And that's how Jesus is. He's close to people. He doesn't have any healthy distance. Aren't you glad he doesn't have a healthy distance between you and him? He's as close as he can possibly be to us living inside of us. So Jesus is in the center or in the midst of these two thieves or criminals. And by the way, we're also re it's revealed in Scripture, and that's why I believe John mentions it, that the fact that he's, he's that close to those people is a fulfillment of Scripture. Psalm 20, 22 verse 16 reveals, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You know, Psalm 22 is worthy of a deep study because that's, we get actually, this is written a thousand years before the birth of Christ. We actually get a more vivid detail of what was going on inside of the Lord Jesus than anything in the New Testament. And sometimes it shocks people when they read Psalm 22 for the first time and they realize how much specificity is there and, and specifics of what was going on internally. And it was written a thousand years before the birth of Christ. How can anybody be a skeptic when God reveals all these things hundreds and thousands of years ahead of time? And that's before they invented crucifixion. They hadn't invented crucifixion when David wrote this. That didn't come to like 300 years before uh, the birth of Christ. They invented the Persians invented it, and then the, the Romans perfected it. So it, it, it fulfills prophecy there. And then also we're told in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 8 and 9, he was taken from prison and from punishment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. Daniel said that the Messiah would be cut off. So Isaiah uses the same uh, verbiage there. We'd be cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So this fulfillment of scripture, that he would be between these two thieves, and we're going to look at what he said to one of the thieves, uh, later, because that's one of the statements, the other statements that he made from the cross. We'll look at that in, in pretty good depth. Um, but the fact that he is with these criminals there, remember, it's easy. Familiarity kind of breeds, it's known, it's known to, to breed contempt. 
you know, to, to be able to see something and be so familiar with it. And be, there's nothing wrong with the record. Obviously, it's supernatural. It's God's word. But our hearts can get dull to things that are supernatural. We, it can lose its significance. We can get so used to it, it just loses its special place in our hearts. But the fact that Barabbas was, was slated to be crucified that day, most likely, and, 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 and he was released... And Jesus is there between these two criminals. The God of the universe, can't even imagine that. The God of the universe, the Holy One of Israel, is there between two criminals there and, and, and humiliated, despising the shame. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us he's despised the shame of the cross. Most likely he was naked on the cross and, 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 and hating that shame. But, he said, but it says that the joy set before us he endured the cross. I believe that's talking about us, in part at least. He pleased the Father. That was the joy that was set before him. Also, we were the joy that was set before him because that's why he was dying for us, so for mankind, that we could be redeemed. We could be purchased out of our bondage, our slavery to sin. And, and he, could, he could free us from because of that amazing sacrifice. We don't know what happened between him and the Father it's really a mystery. And we're going to get into that statement. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We're going to get into that as well. But the fact that he is there and he is in between these two criminals um, is, is not deserved. And it's, it's, it was necessary. Remember, I've talked about how every part of what he suffered from his arrest all the way to the, his very last breath was all necessary. There's no way that the Father would let one thing happen that wasn't absolutely necessary for us to, to, to be redeemed. Um, now, I want to jump over. If you can turn over to, to, uh, to Luke chapter 23, if you'd like. And we're just going to look at a few verses there. Luke chapter 23. I'll have it on the screens as well. But um, Luke chapter 23 in verse 32, where we begin looking at this first statement there. And it says, there also... There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. So he was in this procession. Which these two criminals were going with him. I mean, he was being brought with them, being led uh, uh, to this place. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now, all, of all four Gospels, it doesn't make this big description of the crucifixion. Now, we see it in The Passion of the Christ. We see it in other uh, you know, movies and shows about the crucifixion. We see lots of specifics. We see lots of description. But in the Gospels, it really doesn't go into that as much. They don't do that. They just basically, and you would expect them to do it and explain and give vivid detail of what that was like, and what, but they don't do it. They just simply say he was crucified. And, and, uh, and I don't know why. I don't know why that the gospel writers were led to just state the facts there and not, get in, not give a vivid description. Um, but then we get to the statement there in verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. So the first statement on the cross that we're going to look at today, and we're not going to go super in depth, but it's, it's amazing to see his great heart being expressed uh, while he was on the cross. Remember, he's saying this while he's feeling the pain of the crucifixion. You know, they nailed nails through his wrists, and they nailed a nail through his feet, and, and his weight was, was being held up by those nails, and they often put a little, uh, a little seat for them to be able to push, to sit and to be able to push up occasionally to be able to breathe. And a lot of them would die from asphyxiation because they couldn't get enough air. And, and so I can't even imagine what that would be like, but you're trying to push up to get, to get air. And that's why when they wanted to speed up, because it was, the whole thing was designed for a slow death. Obviously, they could have just killed them. They wanted them to suffer. They wanted, and they wanted it to be a spectacle for everyone to see when they walked by. They wanted everyone to see this as a demonstration of what happens when you cross Rome, when you break their law. This is what happens to you. They make you a public spectacle. They make an example of you for everybody to see. 
So he's up on this cross and he's, you know, suffering. He died very quickly. He was only on the cross, you know, in total for about six hours. And that was really short, usually. And that's likely because of the scourging that happened before uh, he died. And so he, he's, he's up there and then he says this amazing thing, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Just, just the heart to be able to say that. Um, you know, again, most of us read scripture so often, sometimes it can lose its special place and we can get callous to things that are supernatural. And we can get so used to something and reading it over and over again. And we can just pass over so fast the fact that he is there and he's God's son and he's gone through all the things that he's gone through. Totally innocent, completely innocent, never sinned once in his whole entire life. And, and he's asking the Father to not hold this against them. He's in complete and utter control. He's there offering forgiveness or praying that they would be forgiven. And he's thinking of the Father's reaction to what they're doing to him. If you think about it, when he's talking to the Father, don't hold this against them, Father, forgive them. He's doing it, thinking about the Father's reaction to what they're doing to him. Remember, the Father spoke from heaven at Jesus' baptism and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Then on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said it again and added, hear him. In other words, don't put him on an equal plane with Moses and Elijah. <laughs> you know, he's superior to them. And so it communicated for all to see and to hear that he's, he loves his son. He absolutely loves his son. That's why he said, this is my beloved son. That's one who is loved. That's what beloved means, one who is loved. This is the son that I love. You know, I think about what Jesus went through, and I think about how much the father loved the son, and I, I, I can't help, and I'm, I will try to not be emotional. I mean, I'll say it real fast. Uh, but, you know, I have a son, and his name is Henry, and I love him so much. I can't imagine giving my son over to be badly mistreated like, like what we see in Scripture and disrespected like that and sacrificed. Think about if you have a son or, or a daughter or, or a grandson, allowing, allowing mankind to do that to that person. But it was the plan all along. You know, Revelation chapter 13 says he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But that doesn't mean it was any less hurtful to the Father to experience this, to see this. You know, sometimes we get mad at God. Sometimes we, we get, you know, why did he allow this? You know, I mean, we all have things in our lives that, that we could, you know, um, erroneously blame him for in terms of he was trying to hurt us. He's never trying to hurt us. But we live in a fallen world. And Jesus said, in this life, you will face tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And so, but we, what we sometimes don't think about, and when people have a problem with God's ways and why he allows certain things, one of the things that I like to remind myself and remind other people is that, well, he didn't spare his own son from this evil world, how things are all messed up and how this fallen world, he didn't spare his own son. He, he allowed his son to go through that. So at least he sacrificed something and related to, and it was, it's the ultimate sacrifice for for redeeming mankind. And no one's ever suffered more than the Lord Jesus suffered. The greatest thing I believe that happened was, was what happened in terms of the, the Father laying the sin of the world on him. Not just one sin per person, but every sin for every person, past, present, and future, laid upon him. And that word uh, propitiation means satisfied payment, satisfied wrath, that there was legitimate wrath that the Father wanted to pour out, that we deserve to have poured out on us. And instead of pouring it out on us, he poured it out on his son. And it says it pleased the Father to bruise him. Pleased the Father. Because God is just. There was no way that could have pleased the Father if he weren't just. Because his justice demands it. And that's the beautiful thing about the cross. The more you study it, the more you're amazed that how, how is God going to save mankind? How is he going to remain just and be the justifier or the one who acquits all at the same time. 
It's solved by the cross. Try to come up with a better plan of salvation than that. But it requires someone to die. You know, I've been um, on people's, with people on their deathbed as a pastor, and I've, had, I've led people to the Lord on their deathbed before, and I've had people share their, how they're upset with the fact that people like me do that because they feel like that's not fair because that person got away with something. That person got away with something as if nobody paid for their sins. But someone paid for their sins. Jesus paid for those sins. So it's not like justice wasn't served. It was just served on another person on our behalf. And that's the thing that melts our hearts as believers, is is to think about that he willingly did that for us so that we could have salvation as a free gift, so that we wouldn't have to try to earn something that's unearnable. I don't think that's a word, but I'll just, it's a word starting today, just let you know. Unearnable. Okay? It's unearnable. (laughs) If there's a word that's unearnable, I'm going to be shocked. But it it is unearnable. We can't earn that. And And he poured his wrath out. And again, we don't know what happened between, and we'll get into this when we get into what he said on the cross to the Father, but we don't know what happened between him and the Father that perfect fellowship that, that they had. And I don't know how members of the Godhead you know, have anything in their relationship that is altered. I don't understand how that happens. But, but, and so he, he did that for us. And so the fact that he would be willing to ask the Father, don't react appropriately towards these people. Forgive them for they know not what they do. And so he's already told the disciples, he's told them, love your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you. You know, he's already told them the things that are impossible for us in our own strength to be able to love our enemies. I mean, do you excel at loving your enemies? I don't know anybody that excels at loving their enemies. I don't know anyone that would claim to be good at loving their enemies, but that's what God calls us to do. And it's a good reminder for us because we see a lot of returning evil for evil in the world, and that can creep into our hearts. He hasn't called Christians to return evil for evil. He says, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what he's called us to do. And we don't have anything in us to be able to do that. We don't have anything in us in our own flesh to be able to do that. We need the supernatural power of God to do that. We need Jesus's heart that he demonstrates here in order to do that. It it, it requires a supernatural power because it goes against our flesh. Our sinful nature wants to retaliate. He wants to get even, but he says, don't. He even tells them all through that vengeance is mine. And I read that and go, I'm, okay, that, that verse is for me. I'm speaking to me. Vengeance is mine. You know, that's not how you're supposed to read that. God is saying it's his. It's reserved only for him to get vengeance. You know why? Because he, he knows what truly justice is related to that situation. We don't. And usually we go overboard with what we do for payback. That's why he had to say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He's, he's not doing anything more than limiting what we do because someone takes my eye, I want to take their whole body. You know, I want to take their whole life. And that's what we do. We never, when we get even, we normally never get, you know, commensurate justice meted out through our lives. It's, it's, it's above and beyond. And he's trying to limit that. And so he's asking the father for, to give them, forgive them. And, and it's a great model for us. And now, there was one example in Scripture in the book of Acts where Stephen prayed this. And you know, obviously, he learned it from the Lord Jesus. I don't know if he, were, he was there or he just heard about it. I don't know. But he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He, he prayed that as well. So we have a human example of, of that happening in the context of being stoned. He was stoned. They would hurl these massive rocks when you're in a l- ravine, and you just couldn't defend yourself against them. Eventually, you would die. And that's what they did with, with, uh, with Stephen there. And Stephen had a massive ministry in the Apostle Paul's life before he was the Apostle Paul. I'm convinced of it. So human forgiveness, obviously, is something that we have to touch on. And it's a big topic in the Bible. And there's a lot of facets to it. It's, not, it's multifaceted. But I believe that this to be true. I see it in Scripture 
that Jesus has a very, very low tolerance when it comes to unforgiveness in his people. It's true. It's a very low tolerance. And he can have low tolerance, and at the same time, he can have an amazing compassion towards what people have done to us as we've been victimized. He has compassion for that. He has, he has great patience for that. He, know, he, he got to see what would happen to us in greater detail than we did because he knew the heart of the person that was perpetrating that on us. He, was, he knows what, what, they were, what they meant, how bad they meant it to hurt us. He knows their attitude, their heart, their thoughts. He knows all those things. So he can have low tolerance, but at the same time have maximum compassion for what you and I have gone through. But we have received, as believers, we've received God's forgiveness for salvation. And, and part of receiving his forgiveness is giving up our right to not extend it to people. That's part of forgiveness. They go together. You know, Peter came and asked, how many times should I forgive? And so it was a high, way higher number, 70 times 7, higher than what Peter was expecting. He was like up to three times or, you know, it's like, I, I'm like going above and beyond. I thought he was like an overachiever in that moment. He had no idea that it's this lifestyle of forgiveness. It's a lifestyle of letting people off the hook and not holding things against people anymore. Part of what helps with forgiving people is entrusting justice to God. That's a really important component into being able to forgive people is understanding that God's going to take care of that. God's, God's either they're going to get saved or, or, or God's going to demonstrate his justice and his timing, however he chooses to do it. That's not my role. That's not what God's called me to. Because as it's been said, unforgiveness is like taking a poison pill and waiting for the other person to die. It's, we're the ones that suffer. We're the ones that suffer as a result of unforgiveness. Someone that is, is full of unforgiveness is someone that's bitter, someone that's miserable, someone that's deeply, deeply marred. And God doesn't want that. He doesn't want unforgiveness festering in our lives. And he doesn't minimize what people have done to you. And I do want to say that forgiveness is different than trust. Forgiveness is commanded. Trust is earned. God commands us to forgive, but he doesn't command us to trust right away until trust is earned. So it, it doesn't mean also that, um, that you're not going to feel pain anymore after you've forgiven someone because it takes time to recover from trauma and from hurt. And you can forgive somebody, and just because you're still hurting from it doesn't mean you haven't forgiven. It doesn't happen overnight. And usually we're more marred than we realize, more hurt than we realize. But again, the willingness to say, okay, if I've received forgiveness, you remember the parable that Jesus told about the king that had servants and he, and, and he, one servant was forgiven a lot and was spared from prison. And then that, that servant went out and, and, and didn't forgive a much lower amount. I mean, it's a massively less lower, uh, less amount than what he was forgiven. And when the king found out, he threw him into prison and said, you're going to be in prison until you pay to pay it. That was a perfect example. And the, and the king was upset. The king was upset and it's communicating God's heart towards us when we who have been forgiven of so much as believers, what right do we have to not forgive other people of lesser things than all of our sins? It just doesn't go together. Unforgiveness in the child of God who's been forgiven of everything it's just God has no tolerance for it in the sense of he wants us to, to forgive as an act of obedience to him because he's our Lord. It's just like when, it, when you, we, it's, it's, I don't like referring to Christian giving as generosity. It's really popular in the church today because there's many facets to Christian giving. It's not merely generosity. It's also obedience. Well, so is forgiving. Forgiving is, is not just an act of of getting along with somebody in a practical way, to be able to have peace with somebody, it's actually an expression of our obedience to the Lord and an expression of his lordship in our lives. He has says, you have no right to withhold forgiveness in light of all that I have forgiven you. You have no right to do that. The moment you receive my forgiveness, you give up the right to be unforgiving. And, and, and God, God makes that so crystal clear to us 
in Scripture over and over again, and we can trust Him. One writer wrote this. He said, The virus of an unforgiving spirit has infected marriages, families, churches, and nations with devastating consequences. And I believe that's true. We can't underestimate the power of unforgiveness and how it causes division. You know, the enemy loves to divide. He wants to divide. That's his favorite math, as it's been said. Sometimes he adds, sometimes he subtracts, but I'm talking about the Lord, but the enemy loves to divide. And we have to be hypersensitive. You know, the Lord's getting ready to do a lot in this church, and we have to be hypersensitive against conflict in our, among us. We have to be very sensitive to that within the leadership, within the people, within the people in the leadership. We have to be very sensitive to that because the enemy wants to bring division and, and we have to be careful. And there's no excuse for things, you know, lingering on and on and on and on. If you have a problem with something related to me or, and this isn't because of any catalyst or any situation, I'm just, it's just coming up here. If you have an issue with me, don't come to anyone else. Come to me. Come to me and ask me, what's your thinking behind this? Why did you make this decision? I'm not going to be impatient with you. I'm going to be patient with you because I hope that you'd be patient with me. You know, and, and I want you to know, I told you we're going to get better and better at communicating and things like that, but you know, just, just be gracious. Give me the benefit of the doubt that you would want. Sometimes the leaders come to me and say, I've had people, they're bringing this up and they're like, why are, and I'm like, why aren't they talking to me? Am I a person that would make you feel like you can't approach me? Come to me. Be part of the solution when you talk to somebody instead of to people that have nothing to do with the solution. That's what gossip is. And, and, and God tells us to not be engaged in that. So all I'm saying is he wants to protect us against conflict. We need to be quick to uh, forgive people. We need to be fast and quick in giving people the benefit of the doubt because 1 Corinthians 13 says, love hopes all things. I assume the best related to you. I assume the best. I would expect you to do that for me. To, to, and also, we're told that don't receive an accusation against an elder except you have two or three witnesses. To say nothing of to believe it, it says don't even receive it unless you have two or three witnesses. That's a protection related to, le- to leaders. So be very careful about that. And, and, and again, this, I have an open door policy. Come talk. You know, we may not end up being on the same page with something, but, I, but we can agree to disagree and be in love towards one another. You know, we're just trying to hear the Holy Spirit related to uh, what he wants to do in his church, not my church, his church. That's our philosophy of ministry. That's how we think about the church. It's his church. He's the head. We just try to get in line with what he wants. And we don't do it perfectly. We make mistakes, just like you make mistakes. So be gracious. That's all. Simple. Now, John, let's go back to John 19. In, in, uh, in verse 19, we're told, Now Pilate wrote a, little, uh, wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but write. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Now, part of what they would put on that sign was connected to their verdict. So what, what, what Pilate is basically saying, according to Roman law, there's, there can't be a change like what they're asking. And, and we don't know what's going on in Pilate's heart and life and why he wanted to fully to keep it how it was, but it wasn't as easy as they were saying just to change it. His verdict, what he's, he's the king of the Jews, that was his verdict. He said, how many times do we see when we went through the verses, how many times do we see him say, I find no fault in this man. I find no fault in this man. He said it over and over and over again, try to say, I find no fault. So the thing that you, he's trying to say this, the thing that you are crucifying him for, even though it was him by allowing it, is you're crucifying him because he is your king. Of the, he is your king, and and so he said, "I want to keep it how, um, you know, it, it is." Now, scripture is going to be fulfilled here because in Psalm 22, verse 18, we're told, "They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots." So the soldiers were allowed to keep whatever they could from the person. 
they're allowed to keep that. And those things, some of those things had value. And so they're kind of gambling for the right to be able to have some of the garments there. We're told in the passage that there, there's at least four soldiers assigned to Jesus. Uh, and so they're gambling and everything. That fulfills scripture, what David wrote by the Holy Spirit. And then we're told in verse 23, then the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part. That's how we know there were four at least. And also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. So they didn't want to rip up the tunic there. They wanted one person to have it, and so uh, they cast lots for it. So God is complete in control through this whole situation. Jesus is in control. He's offering his life. He's not being taken from him. He's offering his life. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What a heart. What an amazing heart that he'd be willing to, to, to ask the Father and intercede on behalf of, the, of them to not hold it against them. How loving can his heart be? There's no limits to his heart. And that heart should be in an overflow. We have the capacity by the Holy Spirit should be our hearts in the sense of being a forgiving person being a person that has a habit or, or just a way about us where we forgive, we're quick to forgive. That's a good searching question for us. Are we quick to forgive? Do we hold things against people? Do we hold grudges? Do we bring things up? You know, love keeps no record of wrongs, we're told. Do we keep record of wrongs? Do we bring up to people their failures all the time when we have said that we've forgiven especially? That's not of God. That's not pleasing to God to be able to keep bringing things up. How can people recover and get better and, and, and grow if we're always bringing up in their... You know, the enemy likes to condemn. And he keeps bringing things up before us that of our failures. And do we want to be an extension of the enemy in terms of how he uses our words? We don't want to be that way. But when we're bringing things up that people have already repented of and being forgiven of, we're being a tool of the devil in that sense. And God doesn't want that for us. He wants us to make it easier for people to change and not extending them grace and, and not forgiving and not uh, helping them walk in the fullness of our forgiveness in the sense of they don't sense any weirdness from us. You ever had someone say, I forgive you, but then they're just weird around you? We can be like that. We can just be weird because we truly haven't forgiven. And, and that means that we, we leave it there. We don't hold on to it. We've put it at the foot of the cross. We trust him for justice. We, it is a process. I understand that. It's not like you don't have any emotions about it. It just all goes away overnight. I'm not talking about that. And again, God is compassionate about what we've experienced and what we've gone through. He's compassionate for, has compassion for that. He's a faithful high priest. He's gone through everything that we've gone through and more. So he can relate to us. I want to close by reading Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to be forgiving people. Help us to be like you. But we look at this and we, we know that we can't be this perfectly all the time, and you know that. But I pray that you would help us to grow and be quick to forgive. And I pray that you protect our church from division. I pray you protect our church from people that want to bring divide it. I pray that you would convict anyone that wants to do it harm or to sow division. And, and I, I thank you for your church. I thank you that you're the head of it, Lord. I pray that you would help us all to be sensitive to your spirit so that it can be led by you directly. We thank you that you let us be a part of what you're doing. I pray that none of us would have any sense of self-importance and that we would be deferring to you as the one that needs to be seen and magnified and lifted up. We thank you for this message for your Holy Spirit intervening and uh, in helping us to see your priorities, Lord, related to this. We want to be like you, Jesus, and we're, we're, we worship you for your great heart of being a forgiving God. We're so thankful that you're so good at forgiving. We need you to be for us, for our sake. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.